Dr. Ken Corpan is general manager in BP Nutrition Aquaculture Center in Songkla, Thailand. Dr. Corpan has experience in the international aquaculture sector, including aquaculture feed and farming industry, and is the Asia Pacific coordinator for the best aquaculture practices. I'd like to thank SEBA uh, and ICAR for convening this timely and useful conference, and thank the co chairs, Dr. Ramachandran and uh, Dr. Pillai, for uh, allowing a topic not about reproduction and larvae culture during this session. I hope. Everyone doesn't mind that the subject is about something else. So this is about aquaculture standards and certification. Uh, I could probably finish this in two slides because there's really two main points to make, and that is that uh, certification has become a, an important tool for the buyers of seafood to know more about what the products are that they're buying. And secondly, the other point I'm wanting to emphasize in this talk is how to extend certification to even small farmers. So I just wanted to begin by introduction uh, by pointing out something that actually took place here in India uh, 12, some 12 years ago that FAO convened a conference in which the importance of finding some kind of a common ground, a, a way in which certification schemes could at least uh, share some common uh, approaches and emphasize things in a particular way. Uh, so uh, I want to give some importance to what was done there. And several of these statements in these next slides are straight out of this document, which is a, a, a document that gave uh, technical guidelines for how to carry out aquaculture certification. So uh, they're regarded, uh, certification is regarded as a potentially uh, market-based tool to uh, minimize negative impacts of aquaculture and to increase benefit to society and to consumers and to give confidence in this process of aquaculture production and marketing. In 2011, those guidelines were uh, agreed and finalized. So there were three factors which were emphasized that certification schemes should uh, incorporate, and that is social factors, economic and environmental sustainability, and all of these should have an equal uh, proportion in, in the given equal importance in the way the standards are developed and implemented. There's also certain issues that were emphasized what must be included in a standard for it to be a, a credible standard. And so these four subjects were animal health and welfare, food safety, environmental integrity, and socioeconomic aspects. Uh, and one other point is that it was a hope that these standards would certainly find a way to be inclusive as much as possible for small-scale farmers also. This is a goal which has been exceedingly difficult for, I think, any of the standards to find solutions for, but many of the third-party standards are, in, are seeking ways to, to manage this. So I'll have some slides later in the presentation that show how BAP in particular has been working towards this end. So one of the last just quotation from this, this document from FAO is that the, the standards must have a balanced participation by technical independent experts and representatives from interested party in the process of developing the standards, in doing revisions of the standards, and improving the standards. So this, these blue circles in this slide are depicting how it's done in the BAP system. We have a, a standards oversight committee that is drawn from people from conservation NGOs, from academic and regulatory environment, and from industry. This again is a depiction of what, in our particular structure, we have, uh, a, when we're forming a new standard, we have a technical committee who are normally subject matter experts in that particular standard uh, area that's being developed. They develop uh, the structure and the basic uh, aspects of a standard, and then once that is assembled, then the document is prepared for public commentary. We are posting it on our website. It is a 60-day period in which people can give their comments. And then our Standards Oversight Committee uh, is responsible for final revisions and approvals of those standards. So the Global Aquaculture Alliance and the BAP, actually, we, we are the owner 
GAA is the owner of the standards, but we don't do the auditing process. We, we hand that process over to certification bodies that are third-party certification bodies, and so this slide is depicting how in the upper part that's what we do and manage, in the lower part that's what the certification bodies do. And the certification bodies themselves under ISO 17065, they are governed by rules of their own, and they have accreditation bodies which watch carefully over what they do. But we also, as a standard owner, we are responsible to ensure that they are applying the standards as we intended, and we are responsible to train the auditors that work for those CBs to go out and perform audits. And we have currently in BAP, we have, there's only five shown here, we actually have two other CBs, so we presently are working with NSF, SGS, Acura, Bureau Veritas, Global Trust, and there's also Control Union and Intertech are CBs that we work with. So third-party certification, again, just to emphasize, this is a, a style of certification that's done in the private industry. Um, it involves audits being done by uh, auditors who are independent of the standard owner, uh, and they go out and they do these audits. They also have criteria for qualifications that they have to meet, and these activities of the certification bodies are uh, governed by accreditation bodies. And in this style of audit, they, the audits are what we would call a conformative audit. They're required, if a nonconformity is identified during an audit, uh, the facility has to take corrective action and before they can become certified, that issue that was identified has to be resolved. And so when you see a certificate for uh, a facility under uh, ISO 17065, that means that that facility is conforming with the full requirements of that standard. And just a definition of what's meant by third party, it's a person or a body that's recognized as being independent of all the bodies, all the parties involved as concerns the issue in question, so whatever the standard is, and they, involve, they have no conflict of interest concerning that process. Um, most everyone may already be aware of GSSI, the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative. It's an outgrowth, actually, of that FAO uh, Code of Conduct for Responsible Fisheries, but also the technical guidelines for aquaculture certification. This is an organization that is in the process of benchmarking both wild-caught uh, seafood, but also farm seafood. And there's a number of standards of both wild-caught and farm that are now being benchmarked uh, and are up on their website, GSSI website, as being uh, comparable, as being as meeting the requirements of the FAO guidelines and, and other uh, requirements that the GSSI has imposed. So this slide is just showing, I think uh, Dr. Chamberlain also had this same slide, but uh, this is just showing the, some of the different standards, uh, th the first three Columns of these are aquaculture-related standards, the BAP on the leftmost, ASC in the middle, and Global Gap in the middle, and then BRC is a seafood processing plant standard. So BAP is covering all of the supply chain. If there's a buyer of seafood uh, who has engaged with BAP, they're receiving assurances from a processing plant that's doing correct practices, farms, hatcheries, and feed mills also. Um, and I just also wanted to emphasize what, what has come to be the role of certification. What, what is it doing in the marketplace? Um, the, some of the things which drive certification is the, the buyers of seafood are wanting to have better assurances, but also they recognize how aquaculture is, has become so important in the global seafood uh, industry. You're, you've all seen how much of the global seafood uh, supply is given by aquaculture compared to wild-caught uh, products. But the complexity of supply chains is also a factor. The, the, when you have good traceability in a supply chain, then that gives the buyers full knowledge of where that product came from and, and assurance that there are not issues uh, hiding under the surface uh, for those products. There have been problems shown in the media from uh, relating to, in, in the old days, it was mainly mangrove issues that were early on in the shrimp industry. Uh, there's been labor issues in some other locations. 
uh, and so on. So these kinds of issues are what standards are, are generally trying to address and what the buyers are concerned to make sure that they are getting reassurances about. Most buyers have what they call corporate social responsibility policies uh, which govern what they can and will buy by the way of seafood. And so they're looking to reduce their risks in those areas and they engage with certification programs in order to uh, get that assurance. And certification is more and more con uh, considered a price of admission. In order to sell to some international buyers, products must meet some certification program or another. And there are, of course, many certification schemes, and this was one of the reasons for FAO coming out with the guidelines that they did in order to try to create a somewhat level playing field. And GSSI, again, GSSI was an organization that was formed in order to try to apply some of those principles that FAO was, was promoting. And so some of these challenges to certification are the cost that it can uh, take to get fully certified and sometimes uh, buyers are wanting more than one uh, certification or a, a processor, a producer has more than one buyer and one buyer has one requirement and the other has another. So that's one of the issues that exists and uh, will be worked on over time. It takes of course resources to, to prepare and to engage in certification. A lot of documentation is needed training of staff and so on. So these are just some of the, the standards that are out there. I mentioned some earlier. Some of the food safety ones are on the right side. Uh, they're mostly for processing plants. The ones on the left side are, are farming related. So in terms of what standard to choose, I, I want to emphasize two points. One is what are the marketplace requirements? What does the customer want? So I repeat a number of times on this slide. What is the customer looking for? Do they, what, do they want third-party certification? Do they have a specific standard in mind? Or do they allow more than one? Uh, do they want just part of their supply chain certified? Or are they satisfied with just one portion of it? What are the issues that they want to have satisfied uh, and reassurances about? Is it social, environmental, or animal welfare? And then another issue is, do the consumers uh, that that buyer is selling to, do they want to see a consumer-facing eco-label? So uh, the facilities themselves getting certified may also have goals, of course. One is to be able to demonstrate to their buyers that their products are safe and responsibly produced, but it also gives them an opportunity to carefully scrutinize in a systematic manner their supply chain and in their own operation and to make changes to improve. It also improves their own employee understanding and uh, awareness of what their jobs are and what they need to do to improve. And it can improve overall their operational efficiency. So just a few slides that are about GAA, BAP. I won't repeat much because Dr. Chamberlain already did, but we are involved in advocacy is mostly on the side of Global Aquaculture Alliance and the goal meeting here in Chennai in October is uh, one, uh, one aspect in which we do advocacy work. Education, we also have some online educational materials and Responsible Aquaculture Foundation is able to get grant money to do research projects that benefit the industry. On the demonstration side, we consider that the BAP program is a means to show buyers and to show the world how aquaculture can be done responsibly. And just, uh, I won't go over all these, but the, 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 cert, the standards for uh, BAP developed over time. We actually had uh, earliest publication was a shrimp farm code of best practices back in 1999. So 20 years ago, we first came out with a publication about responsible shrimp farming, and we didn't start into certification until 2003. So now, 15 later, almost 16 years later, we have a number of standards. The ones that are in bold are the ones that are currently in use, uh, and we have a new standard coming out about biosecurity. So we have standards for processing plants, feed mills, farms, and, and hatcheries. Consumer-facing logos, this is the one that, that we use. It's come to be well-recognized in certain marketplaces for what it represents. Um, we have a star category system where, uh, depending on the level, all the different parts of the supply chain that were certified, 
One star is the simplest, where just the processing plant is certified. Two star means the product in that package from that certified plant came from a certified farm, and if that farm used certified feed and seed, they can use a higher level of uh, three and four stars. So consumers are, are increasingly looking for reassurances and to know more about the foods they buy, and, and certification is certainly a, an effective means for them to do that. Consumers may not know, uh, may not register immediately what the importance of a particular company's name is, but if they see a, a logo for a, a certification that they know something about, that can give some reassurances. The, the four areas mentioned earlier that the, all the standards should uh, emphasize, we, we, we have in all of our standards, so food safety, social responsibility, environmental responsibility, and animal health and welfare is an area we're covering uh, more and more in depth. Uh, over the, these next years, we're revising our standards to include more elements of animal welfare also. So just one example of a, of a corporate social responsibility uh, policy that mentions aquaculture products and, and wild caught. This is Walmart and Sam's Club's uh, policy. So they require suppliers that sell to them to become third party certified as sustainable, either using MSC for wild caught or BAP for uh, farm raised, or alternatively, say, a program that follows the FAO guidelines for aquaculture certification and is recognized by GSSI as such. So this is just one example. Many uh, corporate entities have such policies. This is just, again, the, the list of some of the uh, endorsers, people that use the BAP uh, standard. Uh, it's about 180 or so on this page. Number of facilities. George Chamberlain showed the total tons. So this is the total number of facilities. It's 2,243 at the end of last year. Um, and many of those are, are in India. There's 350 facilities in India. Uh, 87 of those are processing plants. 220 are farms, all shrimp related in India, and 27 hatcheries and 16 feed mills. So quite a number of facilities. This is uh, actually India is, by percentage, is probably the largest percentage-wise uh, in number of facilities within our program. So I wanted to just get quickly to the, what I was mentioning. We are, we've looked for a long time for ways to be able to certify all sizes of facilities. The initial standards uh, were used normally in what we would call single standalone facilities that applied by themselves. They were certified. An auditor goes to visit them and, and certifies them individually. Our next effort was what we'd call a cluster. It used to be an integrated operating module. Uh, an auditor schedules uh, multiple facilities on an audit that are sponsored by one company, and so it makes for a bit more efficient audit where one trip is, is all it takes for an auditor to go and, and see a number of facilities. It's more economical. And then more recently, we've taken on a program called Group Certification, and just a month ago, less than a month ago, a few weeks ago, here in India, the first group of uh, farms, shrimp farms, sponsored by a processor here in India was certified. They had 30 farms in their group. So just to show a bit graphically what I mean when I'm talking about these different kinds of facilities. So single, you have uh, shown up on upper left, an auditor is going out 10 separate times, maybe it's 10 different certification bodies, 10 different auditors it could be. So the cost of this style of auditing is far more expensive. There's multiple costs that are repeated in this cluster program, there's a single auditor going out. In one trip, he's going around and visiting 10 facilities. Still, each facility is individually audited, and each has its own certificate. In a group setup, we are actually requiring these groups to set up a quality management system where they themselves begin to function almost as a certification body themselves. They have a facility group manager that also and, and trained auditors who go out and audit the facilities. And when we send in a third party uh, auditor from a certification body, what that auditor is principally looking at is how that group is functioning, whether their quality management system is working the way it should, whether the 
auditors are objectively identifying and correctly identifying nonconformities. So there's a two days of audits that are related to just ensuring that the group is working properly, and then we only uh, the, the certification body auditor only visits a subset of the total number of farms. So in this example, I'm showing there's if it were 10 farms, the square we use a formula the square root plus one. So the farm auditor for the CB would only be looking at far, four out of the 10 farms. The most recent effort that we're making, and this will be the one that will take us more time to prove the usefulness and to sh ensure that the integrity of it is done properly, is we're, we're trying to see if it's possible to redefine the unit of certification to go from being just an individual farm to being an assemblage of farms that are formally associated together. And India has a program that MPDA and NAXA have been very instrumental in developing in India, and that's society farms. And I'll, I'll show on a slide subsequently here. But so the important thing about making this redefinition of the unit of certification work is that these farms are formally associated together. They are nearby one another. They collaborate in a formalized fashion. So this is a picture of a, a, actually three separate societies. And uh, the travel time needs to be limited. And they are, are going to be audited and, uh, and certified all together at the same time. So again, this is the MPDA uh, NAXA document, which uh, was used when society farms were organized. And so again, just the same depiction, rather than each of those individual farms being individually audited, it's a subset of these, of these subgroups that will be audited. So this is something we're trialing, not yet fully in use. And just lastly, to say these are, the, what are the benefits that a farmer would get out of certification? They may get in the process of it, technical assistance and training from sponsors and from the government, market access, committed buyers, enhanced biosecurity, reduced risk, a better collaboration, hopefully, with their neighboring farms, and also international recognition as producers of safe food. Satisfaction also for a job well done, and certainly everyone would hope a more profitable operation because they're working more efficiently, getting better survivals, perhaps getting better size. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ken, for uh, giving an elaborate presentation on uh, the certification, especially on BAP certification. It's a very important uh, area you know, now look, we have to look into. Thank you very much. I think uh, you know, maybe one or two questions. Time is over, actually. Yeah. Huh? Very good presentation. Uh, I would like to make a comment rather than a question for here at this point of time. Uh, your, in the last slides, you have very clearly mentioned the importance of uh, units, subunits or groups uh, to be addressing it. I think that's the approach that is required, especially and then you should be incorporating more of ecosystem approach to aquaculture as one of the essential factors to be uh, insisted on for the EA. Ecosystem approach in aquaculture. Yes, so connected with this I think the closest we'll, we're coming initially to addressing what you're saying, an ecosystem approach to it, is that we have a, the last standard I showed that we have developed and we're in the process of implementing is a, is a biosecurity area management approach. And so that's the beginning of going into that direction. It's only this particular standard we're coming out with is only addressing biosecurity, but we are anticipating it will also include more of an ecosystem approach, but we're taking it step by steps, so the first step will be biosecurity, but we expect to go in the direction of the ecological issues also. 